That's totally exciting. Where am I? Now we should. Mm. Hey, uh, here we are at the Salvation Army for Bible study. We're on Genesis 17. We're going to start in just a minute. Give a few people a chance to get on. Right, but people like us to start a little earlier because that way people can join in and say, hey, uh, hey, 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 Nicole, hey, 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 hey. Hey, Shan. Busy. Uh, hope you're feeling well. <laughs> mm. Yum. Hey. Hey, Leanne. What's up? Uh, presume you made it back okay. Hey. Uh, 6.30. Time flies. So, welcome to Salvation Army Bible Study. We're in here in the library at the Salvation Army, Waterloo, Cedar Falls, Iowa. <laughs> Shan is sore from her accident. Aww. Aww. We've been praying for you, Shan. Yeah. Love you, girl. Hey, Wendy. Hey, Nicole. We're actually not majors yet. I don't know why they posted that video. We June 12th. We don't become majors till June 12th. I didn't think they were going to post that video until June 12th either, but or maybe they just wanted to, like, take care of it or something. Hey, Wendy. <laughs> um, well, uh, I'm not alone. Hey, Barbara. Uh, I am next to Captain... I'm Captain Martin Thies. Hey, Marla. Uh, and next to me is Captain Shannon. Hi. And next to her is my youngest son, Andrew. Good morning. And then next to him, no one wants to be behind me in the shot. Whatever. That's hey, right. Pat. You're alone. And then ne behind, next to him is my older son, Jacob. You killed the bell. All right. Very exciting. <laughs> well, uh, we have a riveting topic today in Genesis uh, 17. So we're going to open with a word of prayer. As we go along, if you want to... Um, Put prayer comments in the comments. We'll do it at the end. Um, but if you want to... Um, hold on. My wife wants me to get her something. That's my notebook. My prayer notebook. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> but if you want to leave your... Hey, Shan says hi to Jacob and Andrew. Hey, Shan. What's up? Jacob responds, Andrew ignored you. No, Sorry. I didn't ignore you. Hi to Shannon. Andrew is Hi. now acting crazy, and he's beating his Whoa. head against the wall. Uh, I just Should love to say, I can say whatever I want, right? <laughs> um, if you have any other prayer concerns, you can put them in the comments now, or you can wait till the end. Um, hopefully, I can deduce whether you are engaging in conversation on Genesis 17, or whether you're giving a prayer request. If I cannot, then I'd say, I have a problem. Probably not you, probably me. It's not you. It's me. Um, anyway, let's open a little word of prayer. Lord, thank you for today. We just ask your blessing on uh, what you have to show us. Lord, covenant is so important to you. And um, we just pray that you'd open up our hearts and minds to what you have to share to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Uh, as you know, we are in Genesis 17. But just to put us back into perspective, just a recap from the last chapter. Remember in Genesis 16, um, Abram apparently getting tired of waiting for a child and for all the promises that God had already given. And God has given this promise of children and descendants now several times, right? Um, but he has, excuse me, he hasn't had any kids yet. Uh, so in Genesis 16, Sarai says, well, we got this maidservant Hagar, why don't you, maybe God, maybe just have a kid through her. Uh, Abram's not having the idea, but does um, whatever, uh, does what he was, does it anyway, uh, after Sarai's urging. And then she gets pregnant, and Sarai uh, gets cranky about the situation because Hagar got cranky and there was a lot of crankiness together um, but Hagar had this interaction with God um, the El Roy the God who sees um, and someone noted I think last week how the importance of like God seeing everything 
not only that he was seeing that see that sees stuff, but that uh, that Hagar saw him. Um, and that was really profound. Whoever said that, probably Captain Shannon or somebody. Um, anyway, so we have this context of the promise. Abram wants the promise to be fulfilled through Ishmael, but it's not. So we're going to jump now to Genesis 17. So that's the context of a God saying, no, it's not going to be Ishmael. Don't worry about it. Um, and, uh, and here we are in Genesis 7, 17. So we're going to jump up here. Um, now, when Abram was 99 years old, so we have a context, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. I feel like that's worthy of stopping, um, because what we have here, um, we've heard that about Abram's righteousness, right? We've heard in other books of the Bible and things. And we've learned about his faithfulness and really in patience, right? Um, mm -hmm. But what God says to him here is different. Different than he's heard before. Um, this opening thing, and I'll read it again. And it sets itself apart uh, into Hebrew also from the rest of the things that God says. This section here, I gave it a big star, I put a big box around I don't know if you can see that online. Mm -hmm. I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. Um, and then God goes on and a bunch of other things happen. But um, that is a difficult expectation to live up to. But I was thinking, um, we all know what's going to happen. I mean, surely we've read through this chapter before too. Probably before Bible study, to get it all fresh, right? Um, we all know about the kids and, and the promise through Isaac and you know, the laughing and all that stuff that's going to happen. But this interaction starts off so different. Um, and God's saying who he is and sort of what he expects. I mean, really, up to now, how many expectations have we had of Abram? Like, what has he been expected to do? To go. He already, he already did, right? He got up, he laughed. He's been kind of traveling around Canaan. <clears throat> I don't know if it was an expectation, but to be his nephew Lot. Yeah. And he's had stuff happen. There's a there was a famine, right? Mm -hmm. Um but we don't have any insight as to like what he should have been doing or rules what rules that he had to follow. Right. Rules he had to follow. How do you make God happy? Isn't that a question we all kind of ask ourselves sometimes? Like, oh, what does God expect of me? Um, I mean, so, so what does God expect? And up till now, now let's go to through the whole Genesis narrative up to here. How many times have we heard sort of God's expectations of how people live, act, and who they are? How many times what? What are the times where we've heard the expectations that God has for people? We heard it in the garden, I believe, of the tree. We've heard it, um, I don't know if we've so much heard it, but we know that the people did not live up to that with the flood. That was the people that were uh, living wrongly, you know? Uh, so it's like they were not meeting God's expectations. Mm -hmm. But we didn't hear exactly what they were. We just heard that they were living, right. Right. living so wrongly. Right. Saying, right. Yeah. Like, like, I suppose it wasn't clarified exactly what God had expected from them. It just just said what they did, that what they had done was wrong. Yeah. It wasn't explained necessarily at that point what was what would have been right. Mm -hmm. And it sort of feels like the expectation of what would be right in God's eyes. Uh, a wrong or be against God, presumably, um, 
sort of my feeling so far in Genesis is that's not directly delineated out, but it's just sort of supposed to be known. Am I crazy? It's like sort of presumed that you would know how to act. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the heavens are telling the glory of God, not just who God is, but also who we are in Him. I think that's important to consider as we go through this covenant. Remember, the covenant was first used, I think, in Noah, right? Mm -hmm. Or it was all on God. At the end of the, at the end of the, mm -hmm. and then with the vision that Abram had. The vision. The vision with the animals. Right. Sacrificed so this is walking bef in between. This is only the third time that we've talked about covenant. Pat says, I think he expected Adam and Eve to be more obedient. I absolutely think so, too. And I think he expected them, by the nature of closest with God, by the nature of being made in his image, he expected that, that, to help them to be obedient. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So if this is only the third time covenant has been used... Remember when we talked about, I don't mean to backtrack so much, but this is really important for the rest of this chapter. Besides, we've got circumcision coming. I don't want to talk about that all day long. Um, the uh, Noah, that covenant, that was all one-sided. That was really just God. But remember when we talked about the other time that we talked about covenant with the birds and the vision of is it Genesis 15, right? Um, what was on, what was Abraham's, Abram at that time, what was his part in that? There wasn't, right? Yeah. God walked through it for him, I believe. Yeah, God, God walked through the smoking pot, the torch, right? What was the onus on Abram? There was no. It was also kind of one, one-sided. Um, and I'm not saying that to point out the when it comes to God and covenant and choice, etc., that that is all from God. I'm just pointing out for the context of what we're saying here. Suddenly here in this chapter, uh, and remember, by the way, sorry not to backtrack again, remember in Genesis 15 when we talked about, um, when we talked about that covenant, we talked about how that was not for God's sake, mm -hmm. but that was for Abram's sake. Mm -hmm. Because God in that covenant only reset in that covenant, what he had already said. He only did it in a way that was the way that Abram would have known in the Eastern culture. Um, and I was, I think we made a strong case that that was not because God demanded that. Um, it was because Abram needed it and God provided what he needed. And that is the context in which I am reading ja chapter 17. Um, it's been 13 years, too, between 16 and 17. So, I mean, Ishmael is now 13, 12 right. or 13. I mean, I'm assuming 13. But, right. Um, so, it's, and it's so 13 years that we really don't know. I'm just, I'm just making note of the timeline, you know, that we don't know what happened in there either. There's nothing recorded for us. Um, and then we have this beautiful God coming, God Almighty, El Shaddai, if we're looking at the names of the Lord there. Mm -hmm. um, just a reminder that God wanted everything there was of Abram at that point. Like, I want all of you. Walk, walk before me and be blameless. Like, just surrender your entire life, just as a reminder. Um, Wendy says, God walked together with them in the garden as a friend. They knew him more intimately than any other person on earth from then until Jesus came. Uh, I'd agree with that, Wendy, absolutely. Um, as we're looking here on, it says, I'll establish my covenant after this El Shaddai moment, thank you, Captain Shannon, between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Uh, in my scribbling, the... The phrase, my covenant, my covenant, uh, that God says is repeated several times. 
um, several times. God says, I'll establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Um, you notice nothing has changed from what God is telling them. This is, this is back to before the other covenant, right. the promises that he's had. This is a re-saying of what has already been said. Not a new covenant, or per se, but just a reminder of what he has already promised him from the beginning, just re re-saying it. Uh, and he, Ab- he has not forgotten it. He's not forgotten. It's been 13 years later, and God hasn't forgotten his promises. Well, in, I don't know, what, 25, 22? How old was Abram when all this started? 25 oh, when he, years. When he left Haran? Uh, I don't remember. That's good. Somebody's going to look it up, though. He was already pretty old, wasn't he? Um, I don't remember. That's a good question. Abram falls on his face, and verse 3, Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him. He was 75. He was 75, thank you. And God talked with him, saying, by the way, just that phrase itself, this is not uh, this, an angel of the Lord, right, or where a spirit of the Lord spoke through someone. In this place, it says God talked with him. And God continues saying, as for me, behold, again, my covenant, that's the second time, is with you. And you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. Um, but he hasn't yet, right? I'm pausing there for a second. He says, it's God's covenant with you, Abram. You'll be the father of a multitude of nations. Um, And I want to say, before it was like, look at the stars, count them if you can. And before that, it was the sands on the seashore. But I want you to pay close attention. You know, all the descendants we're talking about all the time. This time, God says, it'll be a multitude of nations. And I'm just throwing this out there. If you're Abram and you're feeling like God is not really fulfilling the promise. You've only had one kid, by the way. And you've already been told that's not the kid um, that the promise is going to be fulfilled in. God already told you that. Uh, even though you want it to be that, Mm -hmm. all right? Suddenly, instead of all these other descendants and, oh, it would be so far to count, suddenly God is putting this in terms that are a bit more personal for him to understand Mm -hmm. because there's a whole bunch of little, like, nations and city-states everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. Suddenly, it's... Suddenly, it's different. Not just... Not just the sands, not... and. And it's also nations. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, and it's not just like you're gonna your family is gonna be great. Now it's nations. It's nations, and you couple that with the name change. Again, <coughs> I'm I'm riding the same train that we've had the last few chapters. This name change isn't because, uh, isn't because, oh, uh, oh, since I'm going to be the father of a, a bunch of nations, then I should, my name should reflect that multitude, you know, Abraham, multitude, multitude, that's not great. Um, consider that everyone else who he met, Abraham, Abraham was well known, right? And he traveled, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, all the neighboring people knew him, right? Mm-hmm. Consider that the way he even would be known to everyone would be changed. And he would be known by the promise that God had yet to fulfill in him. So just consider if you yourself, like, if your name literally, um, if your name became what God hadn't finished doing in you yet. Mm -hmm. Right? Not like, Oh, you know, Martin means a uh, mighty warrior, you know, like, or whatever. Uh, hey, Crystal. But 
if it was all the things God had promised to do to be for you. That's personal, isn't it? Yeah, and I've also heard that in changing his name, that God breathed his name in God breathed Yahweh, Yahweh, like into his name too. So there was like this beautiful like reminding of the covenant and the covenant being fulfilled in this chapter and all of that. Like there was so many so many amazing things that happened just with his name change too. Uh, that is beautiful, and that it definitely, um, that might be w jumping into the Hebrew to really, really see that. Consider then if this is another um, reclamation of the intimacy in the garden. God, God is talking to them personally. God breathes upon them the breath of life again, and he breathes into Abraham, even calling his name, ooh, ooh. Uh, Nicole says, she says, I'm probably reading this, but I kind of love that says that he fell flat on his face just before God promises to use him in a huge way. Because you fall flat on your face all the time. It's comforting that God is willing to use us even after we mess up and potentially make fools of ourselves. Um, I think the... I think the... Well, that's an interesting way of putting it. Um... We might use, I fell flat on my face as more of like a... Uh, a euphemism for messing up. Messing up, whereas I think this was Abraham's worship. worship like like the, the posture of his body when he worshipped. But yes, Jeez. it is, Abram's already made lots of mistakes up until this point. I mean, he's already boo-booed a few times and that the Lord is still willing to use him is exactly right. It's very humbling to like, think that. Egypt was a mistake. Um, and I... Oh, oh, Egypt was a mistake? I'm oh, admit, I oh, I just oh, didn't want to admit it at the time. All right, okay, okay. Okay, I'm not admitting it. <laughs> we could consider Egypt a mistake. All right, fine, fine, fine. And I want to say, um, thinking that God's promise would be through Ishmael, which he still is hoping for and believes in. We, we knew that already. We find it again in this chapter. That's the mistake. Um, let's go. And I want to say this is ah, a... This is, yeah. <laughs> this is a retelling. Scripture's re-saying the things that Ari said. Um, in verse 4, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you. And you shall be the father to of a multitude of nations, no longer shall I... Oh, yeah, we said that part right. All right. Uh, six. In case we didn't get from the multitude of nations... Oops. I hope that didn't just interrupt my string. My bad. No, that's my string. All right. Um, and I'm going to tell him that he should know we're in Bible study because he should be here. He should call me. Um... <laughs> Harold says God tends to use us in spite of ourselves as long as we allow him to use us he will it's a matter of us willingly let him, letting him use us absolutely um, to be willing and I want to say he's waited here all these years I'm, I'm just asking is he is he really completely willing yet why does God have to come back and say all the things he's already said again? Verse 6, I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings will come forth from you. By the way, that is the first time we've had that kind of language in his descendants either. I will establish, again, my covenant between me and you, and your descendants after you throughout the generations, for a what? For an everlasting covenant. And I think this next part is very important. To be God to you and to your descendants after you. So far, until we get to that point, we say, well, what is what is the promise to the descendants? Because we haven't gotten to the land yet. That comes in a second, right? Uh, and so far, is it just Abram? They just gonna gonna be the father of a bunch of people because his name changed. Oh, in a multitude of nations, kings. But then we see the everlasting covenant is described here 
It's that God will be God to you. And by extension, it's God's covenant. We will be his. And that is the part of what is the everlasting covenant, which is talked about one more time. Mm -hmm. And that is, that to me hits a little kind of hard because I think when we think about this covenant with Abraham, we only think of it in terms of, oh, you know, he's going to have a lot of kids uh, and they're going to come back and take this land. And I want to say to you, that is a gross oversimplification, not only of what this eternal covenant is, but of what it means. And I think that's even made evident in the rest of the chapter when we get to the end and, uh, <laughs> and all the stuff that happens there. This is part of the everlasting covenant of what it means for God to be God to you and your descendants and everybody else. Ooh, all right. Um, I, here in verse 8, I will give to you and to your descendants after you, here's the land, the land of your sojournings, which is like where you've been traveling around, all the land of, land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. This is a restatement, this time including the land, of the way he's described this eternal covenant. So it's not just about the land. It's about who he is as God and that they would recognize that not only that God would choose them, but that they would choose him. So he said, again, it's my covenant. It's my covenant with you, God is saying. It's my covenant with you, but it's an eternal one. I will be God to you. And then what does he ask of us, right? That we would see him as God, as El Shaddai, right? Whew. Well, what he asks of us, if you keep continuing on, it, it'll, it'll say. Okay, what's it look like? Uh, <laughs> uh, verse 9. God said further to Abraham, now he's Abraham, of course, now as for you, you shall keep my covenant, that's my covenant again, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. And just in case we didn't know, this is my covenant. That's now like, what, the fourth or fifth time he said that. Which you shall keep between me and you, and your descendants after you, every male among you shall be circumcised. There we, go. there we go. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be the sign of the covenant between me and you. Notice it is the sign of the covenant. Right, The covenant is, isn't... The covenant isn't that you are circumcised. This is Paul's same argument partly here as well. It's not that you are circumcised. It is that God will be your God and you will be his. And the way that we are showing that is through circumcision. It is a sign and sign. sign of the covenant. The Jews got this mixed up uh, and Christians year after that got it missed, mixed up as well. Um, and it's actually really clear, but I feel like we just need to have things so we can put it in a box, right? God says this is his covenant, and the way part of being a part of that is that same cutting, right? We had in the, er well, in the earlier, in verse, uh, in chapter 15, when God himself walked through this time, this time there's something on our part to do. Ooh, I don't want to talk about circumcision all night, um, but it's real interesting. Anyone have any comments or questions on that so far? Every male among you shall be circumcised. Um, I want to say biolo biologically, 
does that mean that women aren't a part of the covenant? No, obviously it isn't because it is a sign of the covenant and women have no foreskin to cut, right? Thank you, logic. <laughs> just, just keeping it real. Any comments or questions? We're going to keep rolling. Hey, Grace. Well, Grace, you jumped in on a real exciting part here. <laughs> Grace was probably like, oh, what's he doing tonight? Genesis 17? Circumcision? What? <laughs> uh, all right. Um, we're going to keep rolling. Uh, verse 11. Uh, I don't know. We did that already. And we have this again. And verse 12. Every male. We already heard this. Every male among you, now it's a little more detailed. Ouch, yes, Leanne, who is eight days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, uh, he's an old man to be having that done. He is an old man to be having that done. Every male among you who is eight days old shall be circumcised throughout your generations. A servant who's born in the house or who's bought with money from any foreigner who is not of your descendants. Uh, Pat says that's because women are better, they don't need foreskin. Uh, <laughs> well, Pat, since it is a sign of the covenant, you're right. They don't need foreskin. I'm not sure if I'm going to agree with that's because they're better, but um, they are partakers of the covenant as well. Um, this is extended out. It's not just... Uh, Harold says, it reminds me of the rainbow to remind us that God will never destroy the earth by way of flooding again. Oh, Harold, will you elaborate a little bit? What do you mean by that? Um, a sign of the, he said it reminds of the rainbow. I'm not sure I get that completely, Harold. Talk to me, type some more. Hit it, hit it, Harold. Go, Harold, go, Harold. It's your birthday, circumcision. <laughs> Oh, it's probably taking a, a while to type. Well. Uh-oh. Shannon? Well, just the water. It's the sign. It was the sign of the covenant. Sign um, of the covenant. From the Lord. Okay. And now this is the sign of the covenant from the people. Okay. So maybe that's what he's thinking. It's the, the, the sign. I bet it is. Harold says they're both signs of God's covenants with us. Yes. I would say this one is a bit more definitive. <laughs> also, quite practically, it's uh, better against your prohibiting against like disease and stuff like that. Like, if you look at like bacteria and stuff like that, like it's it, it's harder to get like diseases and stuff like that uh, scientifically, if you will, which was a, especially a big big deal back then because they were rolling in the dirt all the time, you know. So, um, right, Jacob has. Um, said what well, I think we all know, but I'm going to re-say it just in case you didn't hear it. And medically speaking, it is actually a good idea for circumcision. Um, yes, Pat, we all need to be Ooh, circumcised in our one, hearts. Pat. I think Paul says the same thing. Good one. Um, good, good for you. Louder for the uh, people in the back. <laughs> um, but medically, too, it, it was a really good idea. And um, whether people are Jewish or Christian or not, they still still will do that at the hospital if you ask them, and they usually recommend it for everybody, too, if you have a baby. So, just throwing it out there. Um, so, we say, eight days old, anyone in the house, you get out all the bad and let God in. That's a circumcised heart. That's right, Pat. Um, notice who gets included to represent part of the covenant. Mm -hmm. People that People that aren't a part of Abram's descendants. All right, and this is super important. That as a sign of the covenant here, a sign of the covenant that God will be God and that people will recognize, frankly, people will recognize God as part of this eternal covenant with people. Maybe we sense it through Abram because of all the, uh, the blessings, the land, the descendants, the multitude of nations. But the extension here of everyone even remotely close to you. Remember, his own name has got to become a reflection 
of God to everyone else. And so even all these people who are not part of technically like not part of the descendants, not part of the blessings of God, if you will. These people are just like, you know, slaves in the house and foreigners born there. Anyone who basically anyone that Abraham has influence over mm -hmm. at all, they're going to, through Abraham, have a sign of God's covenant. Mm -hmm. So that is really important, especially for Gentile believers, right? Um, that is really important for everyone to hear. Um, and what often gets, because of Jewish culture, that gets neglected completely, this whole portion, uh, in, in a way, because they want to say, Abraham, chosen, uh, chosen, chosen, and every, everyone else has to be part of that line, um, as opposed to seeing that God's eternal covenant here, uh, it's everyone in the influence, and God even changes names so that he would have an influence everywhere. And not for Abraham's sake, that part, but for mm -hmm. the eternal covenant. Hey, Deb. Oof. Oof. Okay. <clears throat> um, the Captain Chin is walking behind me. What? What are you? She's pointing at me. What? What? Okay. Sorry. Random thing. Um, a servant who is born in your house, who is bought with your money, shall surely be circumcised. Thus shall my covenant be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. So verse 13 basically polished off by saying what I just said. If you just, sorry, maybe I should just read one more verse and shut up. <laughs> yeah, maybe so. Oh, ouch, ouch. Um, but in case you didn't catch that, that the eternal covenant through Abraham... Uh, that's why we sing this song, Father Abraham, right? We are part of that covenant with God, that he would be God to us and that we would be his people. Uh, verse 14, and this kind of comes out, uh, boy, this jumps out like crazy. But an uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He's broken my covenant. Harsh, right? Arsh, uh, any comments about that? Harold says, as Christians, we're all charged with being a witness of God's grace for us through our, li through our lives and how we live our lives. Absolutely. Um, and back to Pat's point about um, men and women here. Uh, then God said to Abraham, just in case we thought that part of this was only for men, because they're the ones with the outward sign here. As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. Sarah has her name changed too. And he says, I will bless her. Indeed, I will give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. And I want to point out that even in a patriarchal culture where women are, uh, women's role is minim minimized here, I say, why did we even have to hear this? Why, why did, other than the fact that, that was gonna, it was going to be through Isaac, not Ishmael, um, why did her name have to change? Her name changed because part of that eternal covenant was through her, too. And it's it was forcing it in his head, right? Like, it's with your wife, not with the other lady. Right. Uh, also, good point. Good point, Jacob. So, um, it, here, I'll switch this camera so Shannon can walk past me without having to see her. If part of... Abraham's messing things up are thinking that the promise has to come through Hagar. It has to be, the blessing has to be through Ishmael. A way to cement that. Remember part of my whole premise here slightly is that this is not for God's sake. This is for people's sake. This God's covenant is not for um, because God needs it. This is for Abraham 
This is for Sarah. This is for all generations. This is for everyone within their influence to know God. Pat says so she could be born anew. Uh, yes, and she was already an old lady, right? Uh, <laughs> so there had to be something, something new there. Something new, something unexpected, something wonderful had to happen there, right? Um, then Abraham fell on his face, again, presumably, and laughed and said in his heart, so he didn't say this out loud, said in his heart, will a child be born to a man 100 years old? And will Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And this is very interesting. So what scripture says here is that Abraham didn't say that to God, right? Uh, he... He was pondering it in his heart. Um, we don't get necessarily, uh, I'm not sure if he laughed out loud, um, but he just couldn't believe it. Remember, he spent all these years now, he's already had Ishmael. Ishmael's 13 years old. And, he, um, and suddenly, <laughs> can I really have another child? Promise, and in case we missed it, um, this inner monologue, he says out loud, Abraham said back to the God, the one that he followed, the one that he's been waiting on, he says, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Harold says, Zechariah laughed when God told him that Elizabeth would bear a child in her old age. And she had John the Baptist, and until Zechariah saw Jesus as a babe, his mouth was silenced. God has an interesting sense of humor. Yes, he does. Um, this part here, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. This, uh, <laughs> Leanne says, just think 90 and having a child. Yeah. Pat says, doesn't matter, God yeah. knows all, even if he didn't laugh out loud, right? And this is the crux, I think, Pat of what we get this real pull on what has been Abraham's Abraham's heart. I have not had any kids. My one kid that I have had, uh, even in the way that I didn't want to or shouldn't have, whatever, couldn't this be the one? Couldn't, couldn't God bless me this way? Couldn't, God, couldn't you, couldn't it be this way? Um... And when he said that to God, I just couldn't help but... Because he said this last chapter, didn't he? Right? Um, that Ishmael might live before you. I'm going to back up and read the very beginning of this. Um, remember, remember God says, I'm God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I can't help but think... Uh, and maybe I'm making a mountain out of a molehill because I'm not doing like a... A real like in depth like part of it, but I can't help but think that that is alluded to somewhat in Abraham's cry out that Ishmael, if I'm walking before you and I'm walking to be blameless, if my name is changed and I'm to live, uh, live in your promise and wait for your fulfillment of that promise, couldn't Ishmael be a part of that too? And I've already said like this. It, this everlasting covenant is for everybody. But there's something special about this uh, uh, blessing of God, right? And descendants and how everyone's going to have it. Don't you think maybe this was still Abraham not quite fully understanding, though? Like, just in the way that he, like, laughs. Like, surely I'm 100. My wife is 90. We are not going to be popping out any kids. So maybe he... Maybe this is like a Ishmael is, how does he say it? Oh, so maybe this is like, I still think it's Abraham not fully understanding. God really does mean they're about to have a child. They are about to have a child together. And I think he still thinks Ishmael is like maybe... Ishmael's going to become Sarah, Sarah's, she's Sarah at this point, like her spiritual child or something. I don't know. I, I think we have to draw here a line, too. 
why do we even know about Abraham, right? God spoke to him, said, leave your family, leave your home. Um, suddenly, in the proof of who God is, suddenly in the proof of covenant, mm -hmm. it has to be a birth that couldn't be. Suddenly, uh, I mean, I think this is, the, this is the Christ story. Suddenly, this covenant has to be fulfilled in a way that it had to be obvious that God's hand was in it. Because, because if, if God's blessing comes through Ishmael, then it was Sarah's idea, right? Then uh, Abraham, Abram, then Abram, not Abraham, Abram just, uh, well, look, I'm going to have lots of kids. There'll be a multitude of nations. Ah <laughs> you know, I don't know why I turned Italian right there for a second. <laughs> uh, right. But, yeah, suddenly it's the birth, uh, birth of a child. Mm -hmm. I, I hope, I hope we don't miss that. Mm -hmm. uh, with that man, God, God is such a big jerk. He made all these promises, but he won't fulfill them right away. Um, God is making sure he gets the glory, mm -hmm. uh, and that it's clear that he is God. It is my covenant. He says over and over, my covenant. It's an eternal covenant. And, uh, hey, circumcise yourself. Show yourself to be a part of my covenant. Um, show yourself to be a part of my covenant. But no, I am the author. Know that you can't, on your own, validate my promises. They have to come through me. This is what God is saying here, right? Um, God has to get the credit here. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm a little preachy. Uh, Abraham said to God, all right, God said, this is after Abraham makes his cry, God, but God said, no, no, <laughs> but Sarah, your wife, he already changed her name, Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name, there are three names here, right? You shall call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. And then he mentions, this proves God's timing may not be our timing. That's right. Uh, as for Ishmael, I've heard you. We had the God who sees in the last chapter, mm -hmm. right? Here we have a God who hears, right? Mm -hmm. I have heard you. Behold, I will bless him. I'll make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He'll become the father of 12 princes. I'll make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac. Yeah, Leanna loves that name. Mm -hmm. whom, yeah. whom Sarah will bear to you this time at this season next year. Suddenly, the rubber has finally made the, ro the road. He has a timeline. Mm -hmm. How old was he when he left Haran? 75. 75. Now he's 99? 100. He's almost 100. Now he's 99. Soon to be 100. Well, he says in verse 17. Right. Well, he's, he's 99 when the chapter starts. Um, and... Oh, no, That's hold on. That's true. Right, right. Um, right, verse 24. It's great. He finally gets a timeline. And then... Now that he has a timeline, when he finished talking with them, God went up from Abraham. I don't even know why we have that verse. I mean, we already assumed that God was done talking, right? Um, Eliane says that was helpful, <laughs> even if it may have been oh, a little preachy. Nicole. And Nicole yeah. said that. Ah. <laughs> Where it says in the message translation, God finished speaking with Abraham and left. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, in this case, I like the NASB a little bit better. God went up from Abraham. Um, what? But Bye. So we have to consider the tenderness of this language here, right? God is actually talking with him. We don't get the angel of the Lord. We don't get any other, like, uh, Lord business. God is saying, God gives him a brand new name, his wife a brand new name. 
He names the child that he hasn't yet had. All these things, I'm reaching out and saying, for Abraham's sake. He's been waiting for these promises, and he's sort of been waiting for the rest of the story um, that's going to unfold in his own faithfulness to God, right? Um, the rest of the chapter... Abraham took Ishmael his son and all the servants who were born in his house, all who were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's household, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin in the very same day, as God had said to him. Uh, so he immediately got to work. That was probably a very interesting day. Now, yes, Ab Abraham, very, very interesting. Very sad and sore and painful day for everyone. Yeah, painful day for everyone, yes. But a wondrous one, right? Mm -hmm. Now, Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. If you didn't know what circumcision was, uh, scripture is very clear. And Ishmael, his son, remember, the son who was not a part of God's, God's promise his son is also circumcised as a symbol of being God's as well, right? Uh, and his son was 13 years old when he was circumcised and the flesh of his foreskin. Um, in the very same day, just in case we didn't catch this from verses 24 and 25, Abraham was circumcised and Ishmael, his son. All the men of his household who were born in the house or brought with money from a foreigner were sick or circumcised with him. And the importance of even Ishmael, the child not of the promise, being a part of that, um, not only shows, shows a, it shows a lot. It shows a lot from Abraham. It shows a lot from God, who's already said he's going to bless him, right? Um, but it's really trying to say that that promise is going to come through your your wife the way it's supposed to and i'm going to show how awesome i am by it um it might be a little messy this chapter haha <laughs> pun intended um but here we see abraham having like physical proof mm -hmm. that god is his god mm -hmm. and that he is one of god's Partaker, partakers of the eternal covenant, not to mention the promises to come with the blessings of the multitude of nations and everything else, right? Uh, does anyone, I've been doing a lot of talking mostly because I didn't want to talk about circumcision so much because it's awkward. Um, does anyone have any other comments or questions um, or whatever about this part? Jacob? Sure. Uh, Abraham uh, circumcising Ishmael reminds me of um, reminds me of the New Testament where they talk about like the circumcision and the uncircumcision. Um, it just kind of reminds me that like um, it wasn't so much about the like the promise was not about the circumcision, right? Like you were saying, uh, the circumcision shows. It shows um, that we are faithful to the promise, but not that like, like it doesn't. They're not directly. They're linked, but not like directly linked in a way that like if you're not circumcised, then you are not of God, right? And so I think about like people that were not circumcised in the New Testament, like the Greek churches, and um, and like how they got they caught a lot of flack from the the. Uh, Jewish churches and like like the the conflicts that the church went through in regards to circumcision in regards to the traditions and in regards to the Abrahamic traditions and customs that like it was a kind of a reminder that like w people kind of got lost in people kind of got lost in the ritual of it and not so much on the promise of God in that I guess is what I want to say I would say that um, as baptism, uh, in all its beauty and wonder, um, is a, was a bane to the church, 
um, in causing divisions and splits and arguments over it. Um, the early church circumcision was just a huge, excuse me, a huge barrier because of trying to understand what that eternal covenant should look like and how can you be a partaker in the eternal covenant. As we read later in scripture, we'll find that when people, the Jewish people had fallen away from the Lord, that many of them hadn't hadn't gone through a circumcision after all, right? Mm -hmm. they, and they suddenly like, wait a minute, we got to get this family circumcised, right? Oh, to show our faithfulness. And that um, is never fun when you're an adult. I'm going to guess that is not fun, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we see it that it became a defining mark for people. We're going to read about that later in Genesis 2 um, when it comes to Dinah and Judah and all that. So anyway, it's a really important sign of the covenant. And I want to go back to what I think is one of the key parts of here, not only for um, Abraham and the eternal covenant for everyone, but consider this line, uh, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. At a time when Ab Abram needed something else to define himself as a follower of God. God didn't need everyone to be circumcised. He didn't need that. Um, I think he would agree with Pat. Uh, he just wanted people to be obedient and he wanted people to recognize him as God Almighty, creator of the heaven and earth. And he wanted people to walk in faithfulness uh, to each other, and by that way, faithfulness to him. Um, walk before me and be blameless. Um, I, I point to that as, for me, one of the key verses of this chapter. In spite of all the promises and all these things, um, it is God's covenant, my covenant, he says. And um, I think it's a challenge to us to, um, it's a challenge to us to circumcise our hearts to what it means to be people of God and to follow after him. Um, does anyone have any yeah, Harold says both baptism and circumcisions are outward signs of inward experiences. Yes, um, and can't make fun of the Jewish people for not recognizing that um, since we, the, I mean, throughout generations, people have just had a hard time recognizing the symbolic nature of why they would do things and what it should mean. Uh, Christians today still struggle with that, don't we? Mm -hmm. Um, we struggle with making our outward things define us rather than making just a reflection of our inward thing that God has done and that maybe he wants the glory for mm -hmm. um, perhaps a new rebirth where no rebirth could possibly happen without him. Any other comments or questions before we wrap up here for Captain Shannon? Okay, thank you for not asking questions about circumcision uh, online, because that would be awkward. Thank you. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Captain Shannon. Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, as, we were, as we were talking about this, I was reminded of the... Well, um, Paul talks about circumcision a lot in the book of Romans um, but there's also a really beautiful um, really beautiful portion of scripture and it's really talking more about the law in 2 Corinthians but it really did remind me of this as we were talking about it so forgive me I'm just going to as we close and pray um, and I see some more people are uh, Harmony House what does that say? Um, from Charlotte. Charlotte says that praise that Christine's doing good and continue to pray for all those at Harmony House that still have the virus. Sure. sure. 
Awesome. So um, this is from 2 Corinthians 3. And I um, I saw this all the time when we went into um, our friend Janet Shank from Army Lake Camp. She has this written in her office. This is like her life verse. So I'm thinking about her tonight. So this is 2 Corinthians 3. You yourselves are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on the tablets of human hearts. That's 2 Corinthians 3, verse 2 and 3. And it just reminded me that... Um, we, we have a lot. We want to show the evidence, of course, the, the fruit of the Spirit, the evidence that we do belong to the Lord. And um, as Salvationists, we wear our uniforms and we say that that's like our outward sign of, of our inward grace, that we are saved to serve. But when we get those things mixed up, when we put those things first, when we think that's what it's all about, it, we really miss the mark, like that we've been talking about what the Holy Spirit does in our life, the transformation um, that our lives should show in the way that we react to people and the way that we respond to people. And so may that just be a reminder um, that it's the work of the Spirit of the living God in our hearts and in our lives, for sure. So, I'm with Pat. May we be circumcised in our hearts, for sure. I like that. Um, so we have... Some things we need to be praying about tonight. Shannon, we certainly want to keep praying for you and for your healing. Um, we want to pray for Marla and her loss. We went um, last week to um, officially bury Marla's grandma, uh, Marie, who is from Pekin, from Decatur. And uh, so we want to keep praying for Marla for sure. Um, Wendy, you mentioned your back. So we will pray about that. Um, Harold and Rebbe for Traveling Mercies for you guys as you are going to get your grandkids. And um, for Harmony House and Christine. So um, we want to keep praying about that. And a praise um, for the news that Harold got from his kidney doctor. We certainly are grateful for that as well. So and Pat's sister Annette. And Pat's sister Annette. Thank you. go to God in prayer. Lord, we are grateful for an opportunity to be together tonight. You are El Shaddai. You are God Almighty, um, powerful, all-sufficient God. And we look to you tonight, Lord, for your leading, for your care, um, for your presence to be made known so powerfully in each and every one of our lives tonight. We thank you, Lord, for those who tuned in this evening, who studied along with us. It was really good to have everybody together. We, we miss everyone, and we're looking forward to being together on Sunday and worship. We just pray, Lord, that um, you would be with Shannon. And thank you, Lord, for your protection in her life. We just pray that you would, um, Lord, just be with her as she's continuing to heal and looking for a new vehicle. All those things can be replaced, Lord, but Shannon's life can't be replaced. And so certainly, Lord, we are grateful that you were with her. And um, I just pray that you would be near to her as she's healing and give her good rest and, and help her also, Lord, to rest in you during this time. We saw those pictures on Facebook, and, and she just um, looked so battered up. And we just thank you, Lord, for your protection that she's walking, that she just had a few bumps and bruises and staples, and and Lord, that's a, quite a miracle, so just be with her. We pray for those who are hurting, Lord. We think about those who have experienced loss recently. We pray for Marla as that's um, fresh on her heart again, Lord, just be near to her. We pray for Wendy's back, Lord. We ask that you'd be with her and give her some um, relief from that pain, Lord. I pray for Harold and Rebbe and for safe travels as they go and get their grandkids, Lord. Just be near to them. We continue to lift up Harmony House and, um, Lord, that you would just be near to all of them. Thank you that Christine is doing well. We just trust you, Lord, with them. Protect them. We pray for Pat's sister, Annette. We think about 
all of the people, Lord, who um, are serving on our front line, that you continue to lift them up to you, Lord, that you would be near to them. Thank you for their bravery and their hard work, Lord, and we're just so grateful, God, for the way that you are using them. They are your hands and feet in compassion, Lord, and we are grateful. And we praise you today, Lord, for the good news that Harold received from his kidney doctor. We just pray that you would continue to be with him. Lord, may our lives reflect that we are your people. Um, may the Holy Spirit reign within us, Lord, so that every person we come in contact with would know, Lord, um, by our actions, by our words, Lord, that we belong to you. In Jesus' name we pray all of this. Amen. 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 God bless you all. And watch the video for um, guidelines for what to do if you're coming to church on Sunday. But we, um, we look forward to seeing you all either online or in person. <laughs>